Sexuality is the great field of battle between biology and society. Nancy Friday. Welcome back, podcast listeners. I'm so excited for you to be joining us today. We have with us an incredible guest, Dr. Alex Katakis. Dr. Alex Katakis is an author, clinical sexologist, marriage and family therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, certified sex therapist, and doctor of human sexuality. And her newest book out is Sex Addiction as Affect Dysregulation, a Neurobiologically Informed Holistic Treatment. Today, Dr. Alex Kataka sits down with us to discuss the effects of shame and disassociation, as well as how the division of intimacy hurts both men and women. So grab a pen, grab some paper, and get ready to take notes, because we're about to grab it and growl. Good afternoon, Alex. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you today? Oh, I'm, you know what? It's trying to be a gorgeous day here, so I'm pretty happy. It is such an honor to have you here with us today to speak about sex addiction and just sex and intimacy and relationships. Um, So thank you so much for coming and being here with us today in this space. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Yay. Um, so, you know, just to, to get the audience up to date and whatnot, um, you are a sex therapist uh-huh. and what does it exactly do you specialize in? Well, I, um, specialize in human sexuality. My doctorate's in human sexuality. Okay. And so I really am interested in all the different permutations and iterations and expressions of sexual uh, pleasure, sexual health, and also problematic sexual behaviors um, where people have been sexually you know, abused, traumatized, um, and or are acting out in sexually compulsive ways. So really sex in all of its human forms. That's really beautiful. How did you get into this line of work? What was your drive behind your curiosity here? Well, I was, you know, very promiscuous in my teens and into my 20s, even though I had a relationship in my 20s, that was kind of a promiscuous relationship. And when that ended, I was 27 and I really didn't have a compass for healthy sex at all. I'd had sex with many, many people. Um, and my parents were divorcing after 25 years around the same time that I was coming out of this relationship that had been fairly, well, it wasn't fairly, it was sexually unhealthy. And I set out to figure out, you know, first of all, who I was. Um, and secondly, what did it mean to have a healthy sexual relationship that was erotic and exciting over time? And it was through my own therapy and then eventually going to graduate school that um, things just started to unfold in the direction that they have. That is so cool. So when you were pursuing this knowledge for yourself, what were the things, like how did grad school look for you? Mm-hmm. How did that affect what it is you're doing now? And what, you know, what direction did they send you in in order to discover or embark upon this journey? Well, they didn't. Um, <laughs> it was really in my own therapy that I, you know, was starting to feel so much better after my therapy. I was in a car accident when I was 27 where my boyfriend was killed. Oh. And I write about this in the introduction of my book, Sex Addiction as Affect Dysregulation. And that event really turned my world upside down, you know, in a painful, but also in a good way, because it forced me to look at so many things I didn't want to look at. Um, And then when I got to graduate school, I thought, oh my God, I'm in the wrong place. Um, But I just kept, you know, persevering. And there was one class in human sexuality. And that was the class that really lit me up out of all of it. Uh, More than psychopathology or, um, I, I don't know, all the different things you learn in graduate school, like family of origin, things of that nature. It was sexuality. And so Um, When it came time for me to find an internship, I found an internship that was treating sex addiction. 
which nobody was really talking about in 1997. Um, and so that was my foray into the world of people that were struggling with using sex essentially as a weapon against themselves and other people. They were using it in destructive ways, meaning they were in pain because of it. They had messes or unmanageability in their life. Um, they didn't know how to connect in intimate ways, in ways they would consider healthy. Um, and so I was working in a model that helped people stop the behavior, but it didn't give them a guideline for what to do next. And that was that became my question and my quest is, well, how do you restore sexuality, essentially after trauma? And that's when I wrote my first book, Erotic Intelligence. What, actually, I love that you brought that up right now, because that delves right into one of my first questions. What is erotic intelligence? Well, if you look up those words, um, it sort of tells you what it is, but erotic is the um, deliberate seeking of pleasure, uh, that's a definition for erotic. And intelligence means the skilled use of reason. And those things are diametrically opposed in the human organism because seeking pleasure is a subcortical um, bodily based process. I mean, it's a base process. You're seeking pleasure, whether you're like craving chocolate cake or um, you want to have sex with somebody, the body is involved in it. The nervous system is involved. But when you have your higher cortical functions online, you're able to think about and reason how much chocolate cake should I eat? Um, how much sex should I have? So there's more moderation at play in that. So rather than saying, oh, you should never have sex again, or you should only have vanilla sex, um, or you should never masturbate again, it's about how can you have what you want that's deeply pleasurable to you and do it in a way that is reasonable and life-affirming and pleasurable as opposed to destructive or just you know be a renunciate with the whole thing. Right. How would that play into with the function of the brain? Um, men that seek out, say, prostitution or porn or pedophilia, where, where is their brain at, you know, just on a neuroscientific level um, when this takes place? Well, those are three very different things. And, you know, we have to be careful when we talk about this topic because it's so unique to each individual's trauma and what has them using sex in inappropriate ways to begin with. So someone who's seeking porn, um, the question is, well, how much porn? And, um, you know, what kind of porn? And how much time do they spend looking at porn? Are they losing time? Are they not engaging in you know, relationships with their friend and family? Do they have no hobbies because they're spending hours a day every day on porn? Um, that's one scenario. Another scenario is that your average guy's looking at it a couple times a week for five or 10 minutes and they're masturbating and they're done and they don't really think about it otherwise. So you see how those are two different situations. Um, and so one person is using it in a way that we would consider sort of more, quote, healthy in that it's life affirming. Um, it's kind of quick and easy and, you know, it relieves pressure. It feels good. Um, and the other one is more problematic because the person is so consumed with it and engaged with it that they're doing it to the exclusion of everything else. And when they're not doing it, all they're doing is thinking about it. So there's a high level of preoccupation or obsession that takes place. And that's generally when people consider that they have a problem with porn. All right. Um, the same would be true for sex. Like how much sex is too much sex? I don't know. Depends on who you are. Depends on how old you are. Um, you know, what's too much sex um, at 40 is not too much sex at 20. That's for sure. Or 50. Right. So, it depends. And then pedophilia is really a different organization altogether. I mean, that's a sexual orientation. Okay. And it's illegal in this country. So if you engage in it, you're likely going to go to prison. Yes. What do you think is the reason or what has been your experience with men seeking younger women through porn, through prostitution, um, maybe through online dating? How does that play out in their heads versus the physical reality of it and then the life that they're possibly living at home? 
Yeah, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> afraid when I answer these questions, I'm just going to get assaulted by people that don't agree. So here it goes. Um, in some ways, this seems like it's a biological directive, like it's evolutionary, because the number one most Googled word when it comes to pornography is youth. And so we have to admit that youth is beautiful. Youth is juicy. Young women are filled, their bodies are filled with estrogen. Um, they're in childbearing years. And so um, they're physically more capable sexually. Their bodies are more responsive sexually. And they just, you know, for, for a lot of young women, it's just kind of for fun. For some, it's for fun and for free. For others, it's fun and for money. For some, it's not so fun and it's for money. But nonetheless, males are seeking females. In part, there's power, there are power and control dynamics there that are really irrefutable. Because whenever there's an age differential, you've got a power differential taking place there. Mm -hmm. And so we could say that some men um, are really looking to feel youthful themselves. Um, some are looking for um, women that they can control, that look up to them, that worship them, if you will, and also that are not going to challenge them um, say intellectually or in other ways, because they don't have a day-to-day -day relationship with them. And when you're a 40, 45 year old male, and you've been in a marriage for say 15, 20 years with another 40 or 45 year old person, um, and you've got to deal with the responsibilities that adulthood brings, you know, family life, work life, um, just the responsibilities of in-laws and kids and, and all of it, the pressures of it. Um, it feels exciting. It feels novel. It feels like a relief to just go check out with somebody where there are no strings attached. The problem is that level of novelty is so intense and the arousal is so intense because it is novel and it's secretive which creates an adrenaline rush as well, that some people can get hooked on doing it over and over and over again until ultimately they get caught and they blow up their relationships. Right. So, I mean, I guess that kind of brings me to my next question about it comes, it starts out almost as an empowerment and can end in a disempowerment, I suppose. Is that... You mean for the males? For the males, yeah, and the females, I think. And yeah, 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 um, right. I mean, the tables turn on both sides. It becomes disempowering when somebody's been caught, mm -hmm. um, and then they're in you know massive shame state and massive fear states because they stand to lose everything that has any meaning to them. Right. Do you think that's why it is possibly easier to go out and, say, purchase sex mm -hmm. versus having a an affair that is, oh, sure. has an emotional component to it. Yeah. And that's how a lot of people justify um, sex workers is that, you know, it's transactional. I'm paying for it. I'm kind of in and out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I think oftentimes, um, especially in heterosexual dyads, women are much more threatened by ongoing affairs than they are by sex workers because, well, it, yeah. because it appears to be strictly transactional. Right. There's, there's uh, not that emotional component where they don't feel like they're losing a part of their partner. Right. And they're not going back to the same person over and over again. Right. How do you think that plays out for sex workers um, in the long run? I know in the short run, women have a vast array of reasons for getting into sex work, you know, but in the long run, I find that there's a lot of cons to being in relationships where it is transactional? Um, well, sure. I mean, I think that ultimately is going to wear on a woman's self-esteem and feeling like an object and feeling like, you know, she's only good for one thing. And I think as with everything, Rayanne, when we're young, like when we're 20, we can do just about anything repeatedly and it's just fun and it's exciting and it's no big deal. But as women especially start to age and as we are in those sort of intense childbearing years in our mid to late twenties, early thirties, all of a sudden, you know, things shift pretty radically and women start to feel like they're not going to have a future or they're never going to find someone to love them for who they are because of these adaptive strategies and this habituated life that's been created. 
And so I worry for women, um, you know, even when women get into sex work from an empowered place because they're choosing it and they want to do it, maybe they're putting themselves through graduate school. I always warn women, do not make sex work uh, the money you make a lifestyle because when you make it a lifestyle, you're hooked. If you're socking all that money away and it's yours so that you can go do something else, then, you know, hallelujah. But when you're spending money on cars and clothes and expensive apartments and all of that, it becomes very, very difficult to get out of it because you get addicted to the lifestyle. No, that makes a lot of sense. I found for myself, what really came up after my escape from sex trafficking and prostitution was my lack of knowledge on how to behave intimately with a partner when it wasn't work. You know, Mm -hmm. when it came to the bedroom, it was, okay, yes, you can tell me what you want. There are, you know, there's really nothing that will bring you shame that I haven't heard about and and I'm willing to do that. But the actual act of enjoying sex was a really big issue. And I found a lot of PTS moments that I didn't know was PTS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember this one experience I had a long-term boyfriend and we were in a sexual position, I guess, known as 69. Mm -hmm. And during the actual act of it, there was some physical pleasure, but just, just experiencing physical pleasure drove me into a complete meltdown state afterwards, um, where I couldn't be touched. And I'm was shrieking at him, like, stay away from me right now, because Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to balance the two. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you know, situations like that, is that caused from say stepping out of your body or would a situation like that, you know, erupt as a result of not knowing how to process physical enjoyment outside of a, outside of your job? I think it's both. I think that when women are, you know, prostituting themselves, they have to dissociate in order to be able to do it over and over again with different people several times a day or night. Mm -hmm. Um, So there is a disconnect from the visceral body um, where you're really kind of not in your body or you're detached, you're cut off and you just kind of want it to be over with so you can get on to the next thing. Right. Right. So the act becomes dispassionate, disconnected, disembodied. And that's a trauma response Mm -hmm. um, in order to tolerate the intolerable. And so rewiring one's brain and body takes a long time. It's not just something that you do because now you've met some guy, you're not working anymore, and you want to have sex with them. The body remembers all of it and all the trauma is in the body. Mm -hmm. And so having an orgasm with someone who actually cares about you can feel threatening because you don't know where to put it. You know how to have sex um, or you know how to have a friend, but you don't know how to put both of those together. And that is one of the definitions of intimacy. Okay. Is being able to look deeply into the eyes of someone that you love deeply and also let them see, you know, your erotic nature, have a carnal experience with them, something that's, you know, hot and steamy um, and while remaining connected. But if your heart isn't open, it's going to feel dead and you're going to be feeling like you're being used by someone. Right. I think that really plays into vulnerability, you know, Mm -hmm. and not allowing people to see that you're in pain or even to see that you, uh, are scared scared or in pleasure even the minute that they have, that they see you stripped naked like that. You know, I think that there's a misconception that they hold a power over you. Um, do you think that plays into our attachment Mm -hmm. styles in relationships? Well, of course, I don't think it plays into it. I think that your attachment style is what determines how much intimacy and vulnerability you can handle. Mm-hmm. And that attachment system is assaulted when somebody is being trafficked for certain um, or prostituting themselves for a long period of time. Okay. Uh, because of the dissociative nature of what we're talking about. Right. Um, so there was a, a phrase that I had read about, probably on Wikipedia, uh, which played into one of my own experiences. But when I spoke about it, uh, I learned that there were so many people that were also experiencing the same thing. And it was uh, RTS, rape trauma syndrome. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience in your practice with that? 
Well, I haven't really worked with that many rape survivors, although many women have had experiences with date rape and myself included, non-consensual sex. Um, and oftentimes we don't really realize um, that for me, I didn't realize I was date raped until I was like in my almost 50 years old. It just shit hit me one day, like, oh my God, that's what that was. Right. Um, and I think because females are so used to being compliant, we're so used to making the guy feel okay. And again, I'm talking about heterosexual people. Um, that women, for the guy, it's just about, you know, he's got a heart on, he wants to have sex. He likes her. She likes him. He doesn't know what the problem is, but she's got like a million things going on in her head about, is this right? I didn't really want to do it. I don't want to hurt his feelings. I like him. If I don't, he probably won't call me again. Right. There's like this symphony of things going on. Um, and so women will compromise themselves all the time for men in part because it's how we're are wired. Um, and this is one of the things that's infuriating to me about this current Harvey Weinstein situation when the defense is saying that, well, women just really need to not put themselves in these situations or take care of themselves better. And that's just an abject misunderstanding of, you know, evolutionary directives in the female for starters. Mm -hmm. So, we can compromise ourselves all the time and we hurt ourselves, but it's usually in service of the other. Um, and then if you've got women that grow up in a household where there's alcoholism or any kind of physical or emotional abuse and their no, their ability to say no is literally stolen from them or beat out of them, it makes it difficult for them to say no when they're in situations um, that they don't know how to handle. No, for sure. Uh, you know, I think even into my thirties, I had, uh, there was definite patterns that I was reliving that I wasn't even aware because yeah. my ability to say no had been taken from me, you know, mm -hmm. because it was, there, there was no, no in my, in my vocabulary when it came to sex, right? Because I had not been allowed to say that word. And I think it, I was, uh, I believe I was 31 and my friend had to tell me, no, sweetie, you were raped. And I was like, no, 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 I understand, you know, like, yeah, I said no to him, but you know, I'd never said no to him before. And, and he just thought I was joking. So he pushed and, you know, and, and she goes, no, 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 you said, no, that was rape, you know, and you find yourself making compromises in your own head, you right. find yourself making excuses. And I think it's also hard when you love the person that's raped you, how mm -hmm. do you, there's in the moment there's no separation because you're almost at a point of denial. And then later on, when you think about it, you go, oh no, wait, this person I love did do that thing to me. Right. And then how do you reconcile with a loved one being the one that has you know, hurt you in such a fashion. Do you see that a lot or can you identify? No, not really. I mean, in the States, marital rape has, you know, I think it wasn't until maybe the seventies. I don't know if I'm right about that, where marital rape actually was on the books as something like a husband could rape his wife and it was okay. Um, but, you know, to your point about uh, rape trauma syndrome, um, the body knows the body is where memory lives and so you might not think it's that bad um, or what you were doing you know hurt you that much but when you get into a sexual situation and you start to have flashes in your memory or your body seizes up or you know there's a vaginismus response or there's a tightening in the vaginal canal the body is saying no or i've been hurt or you know you start to cry uncontrollably whenever those kind of physical reactions happen to a female during sex um, if you're listening to this you should stop you should stop and take care of yourself and don't second guess what's going on just because you don't remember in a declarative way like you don't actually have a visual memory of something does not mean that it did not happen uh, because a very famous uh, psychologist has said that the body keeps the score the body knows you don't have to have an exact memory of what happened um, and so if somebody has been physically abused in any way it's going to come up as a traumatic uh, recollection at some point, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. How do you think it is, what would be the best way for a person that's just starting to become aware of their own triggers and their own uh, trauma history? What would be the best way for them to start approaching 
talking about or acknowledging their past sexual history? Well, I think, you know, for women, getting into a women's group is a really great place to start to have those conversations. So, you know, it's contained, it's once a week. Um, You don't see those people outside of group therapy. Um, And it's a place, it's a safe container where you can go and talk about your most shameful experience and have people just listen and tell you that it's okay and you're still lovable um, so that you can have the feelings in real time that you couldn't have when the event was going on. That is incredibly healing um, for starters. And then also not to jump into having sex again. I mean, if you've been trafficked or if you've been working as a prostitute um, or you were sexually abused and you finally are out of those situations, just take a breather. You know, there's no reason to have sex again. You know how to have sex. That's not the problem. I, I always say, like, any idiot knows how to have sex. Somebody's having sex right now, right? I mean, <laughs> bodies are designed to come together in that way. It's not rocket science. Everybody does it. So why not just put that on the back burner? Um, and you may say, well, I don't know how to have good sex or healthy sex. Fine. But just stop and start to tend to yourself and reclaim yourself and heal yourself so that you can slowly start to wade back into the waters of being sexual again um, in a way that is honoring of your own integrity and your particular body and what you find pleasurable, not what porn tells you it should be or somebody else thinks it should be. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that would be the start of a conversation about intimacy. Um, Mm -hmm. I know when I was 17, I had a boyfriend and I couldn't have sex with him because I liked him. And I was like, no, I like you. So we can't introduce that. But I remember he picked up my foot to give me a foot massage and it was too intimate for me. I was like, whoa, like you can't stare into my eyes and touch my foot, you know, at the same time. Um, You know, for other people who are just experiencing that, who are coming out from sexual trauma, how would you, you know, what ways would you suggest that they start to wade back into uh, learning about themselves intimately wise with a partner? Right. Well, one of the, you know, kind of experts on this particular topic in our country is Wendy Maltz, and she's a well-known sexologist. And she wrote a beautiful book called The Sexual Healing Journey. Um, And you can find Wendy's book at Amazon. And that's a really great place for people to start because it's super basic and very gentle um, so that the person who is traumatized really um, metaphorically has their foot on the gas and the brake of how much touch, how much eye contact, what they can and can't tolerate before they notice that they start to dissociate. Because the challenge is to stay in your body to be able to tolerate the closeness. And our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system and our brains have something called plasticity, meaning they are plastic, they're malleable, they can grow and change. Um, And so for you, you had a mother who couldn't even say the word breasts. So when a guy is holding your foot and rubbing your foot, which is very pleasurable and looking into your eyes, your nervous system couldn't tolerate that much intimacy. It brought up shame for you, which is why you would laugh or get uncomfortable. It felt dirty or wrong. And so if he was your boyfriend and you were on a sexual healing journey, you would have him stop. You would take a breath. You would maybe ask him to just hold your gaze, but not rub your foot. And you would sort of titrate in the capacity to hold and tolerate that kind of closeness. And that might last for maybe five minutes and that's enough for today until you return the next time for 10 minutes. Right. Um, So it's a gradual layering in. And and that's why, you know, people are so, you know, obsessed with intercourse or some kind of penetrative sex. And there are a million other ways to have pleasure and sensuality with someone um, that doesn't have anything to do with that. Um. I actually really want to explore that topic with you. I was listening to your Dak Shepard interview, Mm -hmm. which was just, that's where I got your name. I was had to contact you because it was such a beautiful conversation between the two of you. And you were speaking about that, how, uh, you know, not the Kama Sutra, but moving into a more um, intimate relationship delved even deeper than that. Can you explain that a little bit here for us? Yeah, I mean, that's a big leap from what we were just talking about, because um, that I think is, you know, a lifelong journey. And I think 
I lay these sort of phases out in my book, Erotic Intelligence, that the first step is really healthy sex. What is healthy sex? Can you just tolerate being with somebody and breathing? And when you have post-traumatic memories, you stop. When you dissociate, you stop. Um, and then you build into a more intimate kind of sex. And from an intimate sex, you move to erotic sex, which is more... Um, you know, explicit about what really turns you on. And maybe there's something that really turns you on um, that's part of your kink that ties to your sexual abuse or your sex work, but you've worked through the trauma underneath it, but the body's still aroused by that thing. So it's not off limits unless you're having post-traumatic stress memories. Right. Then you're just re-traumatizing yourself. And then from erotic sex, we move into more of what I call spiritual sexuality, um, where it's a practice of evoking the divine. It's a practice. It's your prayer, if you will, with someone that you love deeply, um, that you trust implicitly, that you know is not going to hurt you, and where you start to learn to tolerate high levels of ecstasy and pleasure. Um, and that's about rhythm and slowing down and being present and all of these sorts of things. But these sort of phases take time. And it's not just about intellectual learning. It's about the body catching up with um, the intellect and being gentle with the body. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, being gentle with the body when the triggers arise up, being able to say no and stop, mm -hmm. you know, during an event in which you might be experiencing flashbacks and PTSD. I think that's, uh, that was a beautiful explanation. Thank you. And, and also having a partner that you've chosen a partner that will stop. Mm -hmm. Chosen a partner that, you know, if you orgasm, you start sobbing uncontrollably because orgasm is just a big muscle spasm. Okay. Um, if you're sobbing because you're having memories of when your uncle molested you, that you have a partner that can hold you tight, that doesn't get all, um, you know, threatened by it or feel like it's his fault or her fault, um, where they don't take it personally and they understand that there's a healing taking place. Um, you want to choose somebody who's you're going to be in their hands, literally and figuratively, that's going to take care of your heart. Well, and I think that that can be a really hard relationship to discover when you're first coming out of sexual trauma. Yeah. Still attracting the same situations to you that you've just left. That's right. And that's I, why that is why you shouldn't have sex. Right. <laughs> Because yeah, and and I found that you know you, it, it's it's about vibration emitting a certain type of vibration, and mm -hmm. you're pulling. I find, at least in my case, I pulled um, conversations, I pulled experiences, I pulled people into me that were essentially reliving what had happened previously as a way of trying to self correct and learn to do better. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that situation, though, at the same time, it's really hard to heal from it because you're not. You're not with a person who's capable of honoring, you know, this aspect of yourself that you're experiencing. You're with somebody who's actually triggering those events in you. Right. That's why the only relationship you should be having is with a good somatic therapist and with yourself. Oh. You know, what are the things that bring you pleasure? A hot bath, a cup of tea, a long walk, a nice workout, you know, hanging out with girlfriends, doing things with groups of people. Um, so think about like what teenagers do. They kind of travel in packs. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think someone who's coming out of trafficking needs to do for themselves. And don't go try and find a boyfriend or girlfriend right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just a rest recipe for disaster and really continuing to hurt yourself as opposed to I'm going to start all over again and it doesn't matter how old I am this is what I'm going to do because this is what I need to to be healthy well and I think that when you jump back into a relationship lots of people are looking for caretakers because they don't know how to take care of themselves right. but they're perpetuating the cycle of self-victimization yes for they're just, you know, perpetuating the cycle and they're feeding it by constantly setting themselves up for failure by putting their power into the hands of somebody else. Right. And I think that's where, um, you know, women have to recognize that they have to reparent themselves, that they're the only ones that are going to come to their rescue. 
no guy's going to rescue you. Um, no woman's going to rescue you. That this is really about you coming to your own rescue. No, absolutely. I think, um, you know, that really plays into one of the conversations I don't get to have very often, which is that, you know, I think even when you're coming out of sexual addiction, when you've experienced sexual trauma of any kind across the board, that men are not the enemy. And, you know, I really think that our perception and our engagement, our understanding of sex, of intimacy, of our own self, I think that's really where the conversation needs to start at is that men are not the enemy. Sex is not the enemy, but our awareness of ourselves. Right. Well, it's our own abuse. Mm -hmm. um, If you want to even use the word enemy, but that is the problem. It's the, it's the traumatic uh, memories and the trauma distorts the nervous system in very peculiar ways. Um, You know, look, when we're tortured, we literally lose our minds because the nervous system cannot regulate the the torture that's coming in, in and assaulting the body. You know, like if you step on my toe, that's going to hurt really badly. And I say, ouch, and there's like an activation in the system and there's a neurochemical activation. But eventually, you know, I take a deep breath, I calm myself down. I don't lose my mind because of it. If it's really bad, we put ice on it. If it's really bad, we go to the hospital for stitches. But I'm still able to hold my prefrontal cortex online and I get that it was an accident. And even though it might hurt really badly, I'm still largely organized. But if somebody is being tortured, they're being held against their will, they're being used for sex over and over and over again, at some point you feel like you're going crazy because the nervous system cannot regulate all of that data that's streaming in, all of the physical assault to the body. Right. So the idea is to sort of return to sanity and we have to take care of ourselves that way. And the men that hire prostitutes are as unwell as the prostitutes themselves. You know, one time I get it, but someone who's doing it compulsively repeatedly, that person was damaged also. Mm -hmm. That guy was emotionally abused or neglected also. Mm-hmm. So it's like a bunch of broken people getting together and reenacting their trauma with each other. No, it's exactly the viewpoint I have on it. I, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are popping up in the conversation. I, I think it stems a little bit from me too, as well, which is that, you know, stop the demand and a real men wouldn't do this. And I mm-hmm. think that that's so hurtful to the health of everybody involved in this conversation, because I believe that the only way for sex trafficking, for sexual abuse, and for uh, rape to be addressed is to understand our own implications, like to understand our own responsibility. We have to heal ourselves because, and I think it starts with women, to be honest with you, because as women, when we heal ourselves, we then learn to create boundaries. And when we learn to create these boundaries, Mm -hmm. then we, we teach our children how to treat us. And our children are no longer watching other people step in and abuse us, which then they use as, you know, um, a model in which to judge other people's relationships and or allow other people to abuse themselves. And so, like you said, it's damaged people seeking out damaged people, reenacting, you know, trying to find a correction or, you know, just a positive reflection for their life. Right forward, right? So yes, and those boundaries, as you so beautifully stated, um, are empowering mm-hmm. because then you get to be sexy in the world. Yeah, right? you get to wear something beautiful, and you're wearing it because you own your sexuality. It doesn't own you. It's not leaking out all over the place. Mm-hmm. So you can enjoy sensuality, the beauty of life, because it's yours. But when you're a victim, it's always being taken from you. You're always being assaulted. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I think your message, and this is so important for women, is that it begins with self-care. It begins with coming out of deprivation. It begins with healing the abuse um, because no one else is going to rescue you out of this. They just won't. That's right. And the act of healing yourself and taking charge of your own life is the most empowering thing you can do because no one can ever take that from you. No. And, and I've always said that as well, that we're not, you, you can take somebody's body, but when you have a freedom within your heart and your mind and a very clear set of boundaries as in, okay, 
I don't agree with this. This is not something that I'm enjoying. I might not have, you know, the physical ability to get out of this, but I know that this is wrong and you can hang on to that. I think that when you step out of a situation, you know, that has more abuse, it's a little easier to navigate the line, that Mm -hmm. freedom within yourself and in your body. But I think it's important to state it feels awful when you're trying it out for the first time. (laughs) Of course. Yes. Because it's so foreign. It's so counterintuitive. It's frightening to say no. Mm -hmm. As you said, the no has been beaten out of you. Yeah. stolen from you. Mm -hmm. Um, So it feels very scary and like you're on very shaky ground initially, but eventually it starts to feel like this is okay and no one's going to hit me. And eventually it's like, yeah, no. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think that you can't exploit the unexploitable and, you know, by unexploitable, I mean the people that that can say no. And the people that are aware of, you know, what manipulation looks like and Mm -hmm. whether or not they're going to fall into a pattern that is, you know, uh, would be abusive towards themselves. Right. Yeah. Can you um, just touch down on for our audience, what is a somatic therapist? Um, Somebody who tracks impulses in the body um, somebody works who works from a body mind perspective, and it's not just talk therapy, but um, they're going to ask you what you're noticing in your body, what you're feeling, where you're feeling it, to help some of those dead and feeling states start to come alive again, so to speak. And that's what creates an integration. So you don't feel so dead inside or dull or flat, or like you hate yourself or disgusting. All of that speaks to dissociation. Um, and somatic therapy is about reconnecting some of those circuits so that you start to feel vitality states again. You start to feel joy and clean and wholesome and the opposite of what you feel when you've been abused. Right. Well, that's that's fantastic. Thank you. I know that you have to go. I could talk with you for hours. I know. I feel the same way. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can cut short. That's okay. Um, can you just tell people where they can find you? Tell them about your book, uh, about your podcast, because sure. all of it's so relevant to you know, what a lot of our listeners uh, are looking for in their life. Well, my website is centerforhealthysex.com and you'll find a whole host of resources there for sex therapy and sex and love addiction. Um, If you don't live in the Los Angeles area, feel free to uh, give us a call 310-843-9902 and an intake counselor can help you find a therapist in your area um, or a workshop or books you might find useful, et cetera. We have a lot of resources all over the country and in Canada it turns out as well. Um, And then um, you can find all of my books on amazon.com. If you're interested in signing up for my daily meditations, Mirror of Intimacy, which is a book on, uh, it's a daily reader on emotional and erotic intelligence. um, You can find that on my website as well. You can sign up for those and you get them via email. And I do a free webinar on one topic every um, month also. Um, And then what else do I want to tell you? Oh, it was just sort of in my head and I just um, forgot. (laughs) Uh, Maybe it'll come back to me. And your podcast, do you have a podcast? Yeah, my podcast is just Alex Katahakis and um, that's on our YouTube channel. That's what I forgot. Um, So if you go to YouTube and you type in Center for Healthy Sex, you'll find hundreds literally of hours of professionals talking about every aspect of sexuality imaginable just about right now. Um, And there's lots of free information on the YouTube channel and you'll find my podcast there as well and also on um, iTunes. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And hopefully we'll be able to have you back in the near future. Thank you, Rayanne. And good luck with your podcast too. Oh, thanks so much, Alex.
Disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions or viewpoints of the host, producer, other guests, or sponsors. I, Rayanne K. Irving, am not, nor have I ever been, a doctor or therapist, and none of what I say is intended for professional or medical advice.